Um, so yes, I've been asked to speak to you uh, generally about corporate social responsibility or, or CSR as it's, it's typically abbreviated to um, in the tobacco industry, obviously. Now CSR is a very fuzzy term, um, a very fuzzy concept. It's used to describe corporate practices. Oh, thank you. Is that better? Yeah. It's used to describe corporate practices. Um, it promotes social uh, and environmental uh, welfare beyond, typically beyond that that's required by law. The key point I want to convey is that whatever good um, tobacco industry CSR practices achieve, and some CSR practices will do some good, uh, contemporary tobacco uh, CSR uh, programs have ultimately uh, been conceived to produce political effects, that is to say, influence health, or in the case of taxation, economic policy, at one level or another. And because of this, it can be very misleading to talk about uh, tobacco industry CSR doing good, given that this policy influence is typically aimed at preventing the introduction of tobacco control measures, which have a proven um, record of effectiveness in reducing uh, tobacco consumption. It's what we call, um, or what economists call, socially suboptimal uh, CSR. The good, if you like, is, is outweighed quite considerably by the bad. Now sometimes um, the way in which CSR works to produce these effects, these political effects, is, is very clear, sometimes not so. So we know from um, primarily from um, studies that are based on uh, tobacco industry documents that some CSR practices have been designed to influence um, policy elites' perceptions of a firm's moral reputation which has an important bearing on policymakers' perceptions of the credibility of the information um, that tobacco companies provide. Uh, so it makes, if you like, their lobbying uh, more effective. We also know that uh, charitable donations are sometimes sort of used to encourage beneficiaries, so the recipients of charitable donations, uh, to take a more, if you like, conciliatory or supportive approach to the industry, a little like hush money. Uh, lots of examples have also, I think, uh, been uncovered of tobacco companies using CSR pro processes and practices to open up channels of access to policy elites and um, opinion formers, people who influence, if you like, the, the general climate of opinion. And I'll return to how the industry uses CSR later. So I'll, I'll return to, if you like, the technologies of, of, of CSR in, in about five or ten minutes. For the moment, I simply want, I think, to make the point that CSR is a highly versatile form of corporate or industry um, political activity. Now, I want to ask by, by asking two um, simple questions. Um, why did the industry conceive CSR as a form of political activity? What, what motivated it? Um, and, and what do uh, tobacco industry executives think uh, about using CSR in this way? And then I think the second question is fascinating, but unfortunately we gloss over it too often. And because um, CSR initiatives are political activities, they're essentially designed to, I suppose, sort of help the industry replace something that works, um, evidence-based health policies usually, um, with something that doesn't. Uh, this could be nothing at all, or it could be ineffective uh, voluntary regulation. And of course, the, sort of, the obvious question is, well, what's the psychology of that? You know, what, what, sort of, what sort of person or, or individuals or what sort of culture, what sort of organisational culture produces that type of behaviour? Now, I think by asking, if you like, why CSR and, and what um, senior industry actors think about using CSR against the broader public interest, um, we can begin to draw out how particular ways of thinking find their way into and, if you like, work 
within uh, CSR programs. Now, much of what uh, I'm going to say will focus on the, the British-based uh, multinational, uh, British and American tobacco. It's the one British-based multinational um, whose documents are, are, are publicly available um, as a result of uh, US litigation. Um, I, I will draw on um, some material, I think, um, relating to the American um, um, conglomerate, um, um, Altria, Philip Morris, um, the, uh, those of you who don't know how, if you like, uh, um, the American tobacco industry is configured. Now, the short answer to the first question, and what I've done here is I've, I've, I've given you um, uh, extracts from tobacco industry documents. If you're fluent in English, you'll be able to read them very quickly. If you're not, then I, I really do apologise. Um, what I've done here is given you um, extracts from um, uh, BAT documents which illustrate um, that um, BAT effectively you know, recognised that they were losing their political influence. Uh, they were losing their political influence, particularly in the UK, but they also felt that they were losing their influence in, in a number of other primarily developed countries in, in, in the late 1990s. So the short answer to the first question is that BAT CSR, a CSR program, and, and Philip's, Philip Morris's for that matter, is a response to declining political influence. And the original driver of this process um, was advances in, in science about the, the health effects of, of second and, and, and or first and second hand smoking, and this strengthened the lobbying position of public health advocates and helped change the way in which uh, policy makers began to think about the tobacco industry. Another important component has been the excellent work of the World Bank and, and other economists, and this helped policymakers to understand, I think, for the first time, that unlike other industrial sectors, what's in the interests of the tobacco industry is not necessarily in the national economic interest. Um, the release of uh, internal tobacco industry documents into the public domain as a result of litigation in the US has also been key. Uh, this told us that the industry had understood but publicly denied the, the carcinogenic nature of, of smoking uh, since the 1950s and its addictive nature by at least the 1960s and also that it aggressively um, uh, defended the freedom to market a product that had been chemically altered to increase the rate of absorption um, of nicotine into the body. Now this worked, I suppose, to reduce trust in the industry amongst policymakers and, and the public, of course. And finally, the analysis of company documents has meant that knowledge of the industry's heavy, heavy reliance on what's called the third party technique in building political constituencies and, and lobbying policy elites has become widespread. And, and this has diminished the potency of, of many um, of the industry's to traditional or more traditional <coughs> political strategies. Now the third party technique for those of you who, who, who aren't, um, or who, who, who don't know, is the ability to get someone who is apparently independent of you to speak on your behalf, and it's the keystone of modern public relations. Now these developments um, set the conditions um, for a gradual increase in, in statutory backed uh, tobacco regulation at the national level uh, from about the 1990s, mid 1990s. The decision, of course, by the World Health Assembly uh, in 1999 to push ahead with work on the WHO framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which, of course, is driving the implementation of tobacco control measures globally. And finally, the increasing exclusion of the industry <coughs> policy making, which in fact predates um, Article 5.3. Now, I'm not saying that the industry has lost its political influence, clearly it hasn't. I'm simply making the point that um, relative to the 1970s, certainly relative to the, you know, relative to the 60s and 70s, um, uh, the tobacco industry's political activity began to decline gradually in the 1990s 
and the industry was aware of this. They were, were, were aware that it was happening. Uh, so how did BAT senior managers um, respond to this? Well, in 1997, um, BAT commissioned an internal survey of um, its managers, which provides a fascinating account of, of thinking within the company. The survey found that staff had uh, very strong views. BAT had brought this on, them, on themselves, so had brought this, if you like, declining political authority or influence upon themselves, but only in the sense that they had been insufficiently proactive. Um, allowing, if you like, public health professionals and advocates to frame the smoking debate. So there was no real acknowledgement of industry duplicity in relation to the, the dangers or addictive nature of, of smoking. And this apparent um, inability to take criticism on board was linked uh, to a series of, of rationalisations. I mean, criminologists would call these techniques of neutralisation, but um, to cut a long story short, we just call these rationalizations. So the survey recorded resentment and, and frustration with uh, public criticism, uh, which managers believed was based on, essentially on fiction and conjecture rather than fact. What BAT managers uh, were effectively doing was denying responsibility for the public's reaction <coughs> against the industry, condemning their critics, and buying in, if you'd like, to a twisted uh, view or understanding of the scientific evidence. In short, this was an organisation very much in denial. And the survey even spoke of a real sense of injustice uh, that tobacco was being uh, singled out for criticism. And the extent of this sort of self-deception is summed up by one senior manager who asserted uh, that the simple fact was that smoking was an activity, uh, much as dressmaking, which had not been declared illegal anywhere in the world. Now, the real s significance of this um, process of rationalisation is that it reinforces an organisational culture that, that deviates markedly from dominant social norms, uh, which legitimises using CSR politically um, to produce what, what we call socially suboptimal um, outcomes, so which produces outcomes that work against the broader public welfare. And this is expressed um, in, in who uh, BAT managers blame for their fall from grace. Um, so amongst others they blamed an invasive media, uh, unreasonable extremists and uh, ever more uh, demanding, sophisticated and demanding consumers supported by vociferous and effective pressure groups. So um, uh, people uh, like you, in other words. Uh, so judges um, in the US uh, were even accused of, of rigging trials whilst the WHO was caricatured as extreme. Now in short, BAT managers sort of came to understand their problems as having emanated um, from their own political failures and the political effectiveness of their well-organized, um, extreme and in some cases sort of corrupt um, political opponents. Now what this seems, um, what, what then seems to happen is that this process of rationalisation feeds directly into BAT managers thinking about how the company should try and regain its political influence. The survey um, that, that I'm uh, based this introduction on uh, reports a clear desire amongst uh, BAT managers for the company to provide an alternate stance when explaining the facts rather than an oppositional one. And in this context, um, or it's in this context, that BAT managers start to think creatively about repackaging their philanthropic activities. Uh, so repackaging the, the, the good works uh, that they do um, in the community. And these ideas become incorporated into the strategic objective of the department within the company that's essentially responsible for its political activity. This is, this is core, um, uh, 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 sort of corporate and, and, and regulatory affairs. And, and this, if you like, its, its new strategic imperative is for the company to be conceived or perceived, sorry, 
as a responsible company in a controversial industry. Um, and these ideas are then, if you like, embedded in the company's approach to stakeholder dialogue, uh, which it seems is, is envisaged as um, you know, little more um, uh, than, than a highly active process of impression management. So little more uh, than, a, than a platform to try and manage the ideas and perceptions of the stakeholders that, that go along to its stakeholder um, uh, dialogue sessions. And, and this process of stakeholder management is, is really aimed at, at driving a wedge, and this is in this, this quote uh, that I've got on this slide, it's really aimed at driving a wedge between public opinion and public <coughs> advocates. And for those of you who are not familiar with the practice of, of um, uh, stakeholder dialogue, it's, it's a key part of the social reporting process, which involves the company coming together with its stakeholders in order to understand their expectations and importantly to give the company an opportunity to address any criticism uh, that's been made about it, not only in these sessions, but, but also in the public domain generally. Now the purpose of this approach um, uh, was spelled out in one document which linked uh, stakeholder engagement to potential benefits such as uh, increasing market freedoms, increased self-regulation and greater intention to buy. Now what has this meant then in terms of BAT CSR? <coughs> um, one way I think of, of, of approaching this question is, is to look at the basis um, upon which the, the company has allocated its, its charitable donations. What we see in the 1990s are charitable donations becoming strategically linked to generating a positive corporate image or reputation which was regarded as critical to the overall success of the company's general, so broader um, political activity. And what's really fascinating, I think, is that this process coincides with plans to, to generate greater returns on, on donations. And this, this occurs um, at both the group level, as this extract, uh, extract from a draft uh, corporate um, uh, responsibility budget suggests, and also within BAT's major subsidiaries. Um, so uh, BAT Australasia's review of charitable donation, uh, do donations in the late uh, 1990s expressed concern about the amount of, and, and I'm quoting, invisible contributions uh, the company was making. Now, the reaction within BAT was to uh, devote greater resources to charitable, charitable donations and to focus on a smaller uh, sample of more eye-catching projects. So what were the, the, the key aims that um, uh, underlying this, this change in, in policy? I've already mentioned uh, the charitable donations were denied, uh, um, or, sorry, were tied to uh, corporate image and, and, and reputation. And it's important to, to recognise that sort of positive corporate reputation um, or image is, is not an end in itself, uh, but rather it's considered to work uh, at a number of, of different levels. First, it's considered to underpin the credibility and therefore effectiveness of more focused political tactics such as corporate advertising and lobbying. Uh, second, um, it's seen as essential to uh, fostering constructive relationships um, within governments which are linked to specific commercial objectives such as facilitating market entry, uh, which I, I think I have on this slide. Uh, there's also some suggestion that BAT saw it as, as partially filling the gap in, in product promotion. Uh, created by advertising restrictions. Finally, um, uh, BAT documents uh, also, I think, tie uh, reputation uh, to effective public relations, which in turn is linked to, uh, amongst other things, maintaining public confidence, uh, the freedom to operate, influencing, influencing uh, changes in excise system, um, and, and defending uh, the company against its detractors, amongst other things. Now it's important to think about how donations might produce these effects. Um, 
by, if you like, altering perceptions of, of, of BAT. The clue, of course, is, is to be found in, in what uh, charities benefit from industry largesse. Um, at various points, this has included food security, uh, primary health care, um, environmental protection, education, and, and disaster relief. In other words, donations are designed to link the company in the public imagination uh, to social and economic development. An interesting recent example of this is, is BAT Rwanda's donation to students at the uh, Kilgali Independent University. The company's regulatory affairs manager uh, made a number of comments which were reported to underscore the role of the private sector in promoting community development. This, of course, counters the general criticism that companies like work against, or tobacco companies at least, work against the tool of public welfare. Now, I'm not going to say too much um, about the use of donations to buy political support. Uh, one study um, focusing on, on Philip Morris's um, philanthropic program by Tesla and Malone indicates that it's, it's, it's used very extensively. Now, BAT documents also illustrate the liberal use of donations to build constituencies or to put the point more directly to buy the support of beneficiaries. Um, so this was seen to be a direct um, effect of contribution, uh, contributions made in Pex Hungary, which significantly for those interested in you know, like soft political influence in developing countries was held um, within BAT, held up within BAT as a model for future patterns of giving. Um, in addition to building political constituencies, donations were also used to both facilitate access uh, to policy elites and to build relationships with them. An interesting point borne out by the documents is that BAT considered philanthropy as a way of gaining access to officials in transnational institutions as well as national governments. And, and the capacity of donations to, if you like, generate access is optimised, I think, partly uh, by an explicit policy of um, uh, identifying um, uh, projects that have a high political priority which create a basis for meeting and talking to uh, public officials and partly by increasing the circumstances in which BAT managers um, might come into contact with public officials at events such as conferences, opening ceremonies and um, sponsored events. And of course because philanthropic contributions you know, really have the capacity to sort of regularise access, to make it routine, to normalise it. They can work to create trust between companies uh, and policy elites. Finally, um, charitable donations are also allocated on the, on the basis of their effect in, in shaping the tobacco control agenda. And there seem to be, I think, two ways in which this works. The first involves uh, donations which, if you like, reinforce key industry messages that are designed to shift the discourse of tobacco control away from public health uh, to um, the terrain or onto the terrain, if you like, of, of political freedoms. And this is implied in, in the text on this slide which loosely suggests that donations to the arts in Australia have been allocated on the, on the basis of their capacity to promote the ideals of freedom, um, choice and um, democracy. The, the second way in which this work seems, I think, you know, particularly cynical, and, and it relates to BAT's efforts to, at, at various points, uh, to shift perceptions of if you like, of, of risk to health in developing countries by highlighting um, other risks to public health. So BAT's Public Affairs Handbook for 1995 noted that this would be achieved by highlighting specific health concerns and issues in, in different parts 
of the world which it claimed were being paid less than satisfactory attention. So the aim, if you like, is, is, is to highlight other health problems uh, with a view to convincing policymakers and, 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 and the general public in developing countries that smoking doesn't represent um, such, at least relatively, um, such um, a grave risk uh, to public health. Now we know from the existing literature that BAT has deliberately tried to use charitable donations to produce this effect. So the Beijing Liver Foundation uh, was formed to uh, reprioritize uh, the agenda of the Chinese Ministry for Public Health uh, to divert attention from smoking to liver related diseases. Several of BAT's current programs need, I think, really need to be understood in this context. An obvious example is BAT's um, South Africa uh, Signature Trust, which was set up in 2003 to address um, issues directly related to HIV in South Africa's disadvantaged communities. And this has been a really significant program. I mean, they've, they've put a, a, you know, quite, um, quite a lot of money into it. Um, by 2008, it had funded projects um, to the value of, of 25 million rand, which I've got down here as, as just over um, uh, 20 million pounds sterling. Uh, so about 25, 26 million euro. Um, another example is the significant um, endemic disease program which aims to reduce the impact of malaria um, uh, and, and tuberculosis, tuberculosis amongst other sort of serious diseases um, in BAT's major markets and this includes Bangladesh, Malaysia, uh, Russia and China. Um, so, what I've done on this slide is, is simply um, categorise the range of political effects uh, that, um, uh, that, that, that lie behind the allocation of, of charitable do donations in BAT. And, and, and this, you know, you know, the material that I've presented here um, uh, is supported by uh, published work on, on, on Philip uh, Morris. And of course, what it does is it illustrates the tobacco industry CSR is an extraordinarily useful and versatile uh, political tactic. And the fact, I think, that Article 5.3 of the SETC increases, if you like, the political risks of more traditional face-to-face -face lobbying. Obviously, this will depend on whether or not the uh, whether or not Article 5.3 is is actually implemented, but the fact that it does create political risks, uh, or increase political risks, sorry, in, in, relates to this, in relation to this more traditional uh, political activity, suggests that, that philanthropy, CSR, charitable donations, may become an increasingly significant tool uh, for tobacco companies. Um, and I think I'll, I'll need to, um, uh, ended there. So, thanks for listening.